All right. I think we are live. So welcome, everybody. Um, I think we'll start getting some viewers here in a minute as we start posting the link out to several folks. Um, and I think folks will be coming in, in as we're in the middle of progress. But I just want to welcome everybody to uh, the third Dangerous Ideas Journal Club. Um, we'll be talking about a really interesting paper just published in Science called a large, a large scale uh, model of the functioning brain um, by Chris Elias Smith et al. Um, before I get started, I, uh, so I'm Stephen Larson. I coordinate the Open Worm Project, um, a simulation project uh, that also is interested in work focusing on simulating nervous systems. Um, I have a PhD in computational neuroscience from UCSD. Um, and I'm joined by a lot of great folks who also think about brain modeling from many different perspectives uh, and are uh, interested in this paper and this topic. And I'll let them introduce themselves uh, from left to right. So we'll start with Ivani. Hello. Uh, can you hear me OK? Yeah, OK. So my name is Giovanni, and uh, I, I'm a member of the Open, Open World Project, member and founder. I've been there since the beginning. And uh, my background is mainly software engineering. So I have a degree in electronic engineering and um, an MSc in software engineering. So I think about these things about in, in terms of from, from, from an engineering perspective. So many of my interventions will be how do we actually do this? And, uh, Te technical um, uh, angle, but uh, that's pretty much everything from me. So, I can go to the next. Okay. okay. Hello, my name is James Pern, and I'm dialing in from Munich in Germany. My background is in biochemistry. I have a degree in biochemistry, and I'm currently the CTO of a small company that runs a network of news websites across Europe. And in my spare time, I'm also very interested in artificial intelligence and brain simulation and neuroscience. And I maintain the website artificialbrains.com. Okay. Justin? I am Justin Kiggins, and I'm a company uh, PhD student at UC San Diego. Um, I deal with uh, auditory perception and auditory coding and trying to figure out how the brain handles um, things like language and, and those types of stuff. So, great. Good having you. Emily? Hi, I'm Kim Reinhold. I'm also a comp neuro student, graduate student at UCSD, and I actually do experimental work, um, optogenetics in the mouse visual system, but I'm also taking the comp neuro classes. Mm -hmm. Great. Paxton? Hey, I'm uh, Paxton Frady, and I'm also in the comp neuro program at UC San Diego, and I work in uh, invertebrates and uh, look at neural circuits and how neural circuits produce behaviors. Great. I'm Shri Joy Tripathi. I'm a computational neuroscience graduate student at Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh. I study properties of single neurons, and I develop the website neuroelectro.org, which is a repository of neuron information. Great. And it's awesome. Okay. Thanks for introducing yourselves. For folks just joining us here, we are in progress on uh, the Journal Club. Uh, so the way this is going to work is I've uh, put some slides together uh, doing an overview of this paper. Um, and I'm going to rely on uh, the other folks here in the channel to like, keep me to task and to make sure that uh, I don't misstate anything um, and, um, and to chime in when appropriate. Um, so uh, for all of you in the channel, just feel free to speak up. If there's some point that you want to make, I won't be able to see you raise your hand. Um, but uh, also, if you're just joining us, feel free to post a comment in, uh, in the stream uh, wherever you like. And uh, some of the folks here will be watching what you post and asking uh, and, and hopefully injecting your questions as well uh, verbally uh, into, into the stream. So please feel free to, to talk about that. And all this is going to get archived on YouTube later. So if you miss anything, you want to go back, uh, you'll be able to. OK. So let me get started. Get my desktop here. OK, so uh, this is a paper um, the authors uh, is published in Science. So my goals here are basically, first I'm going to explain aspects of the paper that may make it hard to understand for folks who are not in the field. Um, this kind of work kind of requires you to have enough of understanding of the brain and the nervous system to make sense of it. 
as well as uh, some understanding of computer science and some topics in that. Uh, this, so that kind of means that uh, it uh, can be a little bit of a daunting experience to try and read this paper, so I'm going to try to clarify some things there that I can. Um, I want to put also this paper in context of other work that's being done. Um, so the, the, the field of brain simulation is, is growing. Um, there's a lot of things going on. Actually, uh, James uh, uh, curates a site called artificialbrains.com. It's doing a pretty good job of keeping tabs on all the different things happening. Um, I don't have quite a comprehensive context here today, but um, I think that uh, I can at least start to give a se sense of it. Um, and then, of course, we're going to walk through, walk through the paper and discuss aspects of the paper along the way. And again, if you have comments, please feel free to um, to, to add them in uh, in, in Google Plus um, while, while we're going along. OK. So uh, just very high level, some significance uh, of, of what the paper is trying to accomplish. So, so essentially, it's trying to build a bridge between topics in artificial intelligence and neuroscience. Um, specifically, authors write that, that it performs a, a subset of simulated tasks that are associated with human cognition. Um, and parts of the model then ground out in activity of spiking models of neurons. Um, and that's a pretty ambitious scope, really, uh, especially with something like the brain uh, of the human that has so many neurons in it and does so many complicated things. And there's obviously been, there have been many papers that try to do one or the other um, you know, model what neurons do, model what uh, you know human cognition does, and there's a, a, quite a literature actually on things that, that that do something like this. But it really is a very like comprehensive effort. Um, it is trying to pull in a lot of different pieces and parts together. So that's that's basically what its what its goal is is to is to add to that bridge, and I think it largely accomplishes that. Um, it's published in Science, which is uh, for those who are uh, not familiar with uh, you know. Academia, that's um, one of the, uh, that's basically a top reputation journal in all of the field of science. So if you get published there, people take notice. Um, and so that's, you know, one of the reasons why I think it's really worthy of uh, discussion today. Um, and then, as I was saying, so this paper is kind of a tip of an iceberg of a lot of other work. And what you read in just the few pages that are published in the main manuscript really sits atop not only uh, many references of other whole papers and PhD theses that flesh out other uh, parts of it, but also represent um, you know, the combined work of many years of effort. Um, and so a lot of those individual pieces have kind of been validated by peer review along the way, um, and they're kind of assembled together, fit into a unified framework in this paper. So that's one of the reasons it's a little tricky to kind of get your mind wrapped around it, because as soon as you start to get into details, you, you flip into another paper. But, um, I'm going to provide a high-level perspective as, as I can on, on that. So um, of the manuscript, just to get a sense of where we're going, the Cliff's Notes version of the paper is that it states its goal, bridge the brain, brain behavior gap. It wants to do it in a particular way of modeling some things that human beings do, um, but doing it in a way that um, you can point at neurons and see activity of neurons. Um, it describes the input the model uses and the tasks the model can perform. This is talking a little bit about, OK, what do I put into the model? What do I get out of the model? Uh, it describes the anatomical and functional architecture of the model. So how, what are its pieces and parts? Um, and what does it do? Um, then they walk through an example of serial working memory task that showcases how it works. Um, they walk through uh, the RPM task, the Raven's Progressive Matrices task, and explains how it works. Uh, they compare. They do a comparison of some population-wide performance of the models. So they run the model a bunch of times to, uh, and they're with randomized initial conditions, and they're testing that against what a lot of humans did on a cognitive task. And one, of the, one of the advantages of this paper, because they're using tasks that are familiar to cognitive science, um, they, uh, they have actually, there are other papers who've, who've done the same protocol of, of experiment, or you know, what they would say is the same, exper uh, the same uh, experimental protocol. Um, and, um, and then they, they can compare that data. And then, and then they kind of zoom out again, and they say, well, you know, but just keep in mind that our real purpose is that we're trying to do something that's unified. We're trying to ex have a, um, a working theory of information processing in cognition. And, uh, and they do that talking a little bit about learning. Um, and then they talk about some limitations of the model. So that's the, the high level overview of, of, of what they talk about. And that's the structure that I'm going to follow um, here in this presentation. So to get, to, get really, to get started at a really high view, for those, for those of you who are coming into the field you know, uh, not knowing that much about, about neuroscience, I, I like this paper from 
uh, Shepard's uh, synaptic organization of the brain, um, where um, if you start here at the um, just thinking about behavior, um, and then you, you go one level in, and you're looking a little bit at the level of systems and pathways. This is where we think about how you know information that's coming into your eyes or are actually going into the system of your brain, getting sensed, and then getting processed through. And so this actual this side view is useful because um, the authors use the same side view to kind of look at at the brain. So basically, eyes are here, uh, visual system here, motor cortex up here, frontal cortex over there. You'll see that uh, that same pattern. Um, as, as the first figure of the paper. But then you, as you delve in deeper, um, there's another level of organization, which is local circuits, uh, how, how neurons talk to each other and their behavior. We go down the, in, then to the level of individual neurons. And one of the key things is that, um, you know, one of the key features of a neuron is an action potential, a spike, which is a readout of a, the electrical activity of that neuron. And we'll see spikes playing, or models of spikes playing into this paper quite, quite a lot. Um, beyond that, um, a level of organization uh, focuses on this is like taking a piece here out of this little tree and then blowing it up so it's this stubby thing and these things connecting to it are, um, are the, um, the axonal terminals of another neuron that's trying to partner with this one. And then you zoom in there into one of these and you see a lot that's going on molecularly at the level of a synapse when chemical is going across uh, the gradient here to signal. And then even beyond that, you know, Folks worry about what happens to the level of individual ion channels. So, um, in a in a one in one picture, this shows a comprehensive idea of what's going on in neuroscience. And there are people who work at all of these different levels individually. Um, and one of the challenges is really trying to integrate across them. So, this paper, I think, um, basically covers these levels um, in some in some detail. I'll talk a little bit about how um, the like the level of detail of neuron that they go into. Um, this isn't to say that there aren't connections between the neurons. That's certainly represented here within local circuits. But I would say that this is probably the main area that, that is being bridged um, by this model. And other, you know, other models of brain will try to take up different pieces of it, right? Some will try to look at local circuits um, but go down to level of synapses. And others will just focus on you know, neurons and go all the way to ion channels but then just be like single single neuron. So there's, in fact, a lot of work in computational neuroscience across these different levels. But this circle here kind of represents where we're going. This is shown in another way, um, in another classic diagram that just kind of shows exactly the same thing, but looking at it in terms of size and scale. So at the level of the central nervous system, that breaks down into systems at the level of centimeters, maps and networks at a centimeter and a millimeter, neurons at 100 micrometers, synapses at one micrometer, and, and molecules down to the level of angstroms. And again, this is sort of the level here that we're looking at um, what this model kind of occupies uh, different bridges across there. And when I say that it doesn't cover synapses, again, it's not to say that there aren't connections between the neurons, but just at the level of detail uh, of synapses, um, you know, is probably, you know, is, um, there are other levels of complexity that one might, that one might go. Now, there are, there are some neurotransmitters uh, that are built in to the system, so it does touch the molecular scale kind of indirectly, but um, there are other models that you know would go much much more deeply into say, tracking the motion of, of molecules through, within a cell. So um, I hope I'm being charitable with that description. I'm just you know, trying to give everybody a sense of, of where we're of where we're looking at. So just trust, trying to cross two of these scales is challenging. Trying to cross all these scales is is you know really really tricky. Um, I think that the paper does a, a reasonable job of of bridging across. Okay, so now um, the first figure of the paper. And again, as I was sort of saying, this, this is the side view of the brain that we were sort of seeing before with this is the eyeball and information coming in. And so what they're showing us here in this picture, um, the color code is important. So um, the pieces that are circled in red uh, up here correspond to pieces in red over here, green over here in the middle, uh, purple over here as output. Um, so that's the first thing to recognize. I wanted to go into more detail, though, on this because, again, if you're not familiar with neuroscience, these letters kind of probably look like alphabet soup to you. So um, something that you can more easily kind of Google. So this, this red part here is basically um, visual cortex and extra striate visual cortex. It, it's technically called. But for, for simplicity, let's say this is, this is visual cortex and, and the hierarchy there. Um, then this piece is, is temporal cortex, or where we think of things like objects and places getting stored more generally. Um, parietal cortex, which is largely responsible for uh, transformations, uh, dealing with space and, and you know, understanding um, uh, 
visual space or space around the body. Uh, prefrontal and frontal cortex, uh, that's the, you know, the magical part that, uh, you know, is, is um, one of the things that grew the largest in human beings, and folks really attribute a lot of intelligence to that, and, and there's, a lot, um, of, um, there's a lot of discussion about what happens there, um, but uh, largely this is a, a big aggregation point of a lot of the other pieces um, of the brain, and a lot of uh, flexible control and uh, memory, short-term memory, working memory uh, retained there over delay periods, uh, and that sort of thing. Now the basal ganglia, this one might be a little bit confusing if you aren't familiar with it, so because it's kind of mapped as if it's actually part of cortex, but actually this is technically underneath the cortex, um, so it's inside, and it's a series of circuits that um, have been attributed to things like, um, you know, stopping uh, a go, no-go response, so this is where, when he talks about action selection, um, very broadly speaking, basal ganglia is said to be, be responsible um, for that process. And then motor cortex, which is where once, you know, the brain has kind of decided on what action it's going to take, again, broadly speaking, uh, motor cortex is what plans it, and then motor cortex shoots out to your body via the brainstem, down this way in collaboration with the, with the cerebellum, and, uh, and, and produces behavior. So very coarsely speaking, that's, that's what uh, they're doing. And then they've taken, so they've, they've wrapped up these, these basic pieces, um, and they've made a functional architecture out of that. Now, also to be clear, right, there are pieces of this, um, you know, of the brain which are left out, right? Um, so the hippocampus is one piece that is a you know, major component. A lot of work uh, gets done on hippocampus, and that's not represented here. And, um, and that's fine. It's not necessarily, it doesn't have, not, you don't have to have every single piece of the brain in order to um, have a, a, a good comprehensive model. The point is to have a, a framework in which all these things can fit in, but it's not an explicit place for that. Um, some of its functions may be captured by other things. Also, brainstem is a very significant part of the brain. A, a, a lot happens there. Um, a lot of drives are, are created there, and cerebellum as well for motor coordination, so some of those pieces are, are not there. So just to be clear, right, um, I think that the idea is to pick a set of um, brain regions that have a minimum uh, that minimum in, um, involvement in the kinds of tasks that they're interested in, but then that doesn't necessarily require that absolutely every single you know piece and part of brain have to be captured. Um, hey, Steven. Yeah. Um, one of the authors is trying to join. I think you have to invite him. It's Chris Elias Smith. Oh, really? You'd like to be in the channel? Yes. Hmm. Okay. Well, so this is a little unplanned. I uh, would have hoping that that uh, actually could happen, but. Uh, Whoa. Let me, uh, let's, uh, let's get him in here. So. It, also, it also looks like uh, Paul King has uh, joined us and is trying to figure out how to connect with us, too. So. Okay, well, I will resend uh, invites to both of them. I will send an invite to Chris right now. So, Chris, I hope you can come. And Paul, I'm also sending that. So, the invitation just went out. Um, and uh, I'm totally willing to be taking a task for anything that I've just said. So, um, well, we'll see if those folks join, because that will make it a really interesting conversation. Um, that's great. Okay. Um, so I'll hear the ding, hopefully, when they pop in. Hopefully that's going to happen in a second. But for right now, I'm just going to go back to the um, presentation, and we'll see what happens. You this live, right? Okay. <laughs> all right. So anyway, so this, all this um, is, is uh, the, the architecture of this spawn system, S-P-A-U-N. Um, and um, so what we've just shown are the pieces of the brain of the nervous system. This here, though, I think is, is what really represents um, a, a functional hypothesis of how what these brain regions are thought to do work together. And um, that's the main thing, that, that, that's one of the main kind of um, contributions of the paper is a, um, a description of, oh, if uh, whoever's got the keyboard, if you can mute your, um, your um, I can hear the keyboard clacking, um, that would be appreciated. So this is kind of one of the intellectual contributions of the paper. Um, and this, again, is uh, a combination of a lot of work that's been done over the time. Let's see. Should we go coming back in? OK. Um, so to, to start with the beginning, so um, the model here um, is visual input in, uh, motor output out. Um, so that's your basic black box. Is, and, and so now we talk about the stuff in the center. Um, I think it's important to see the, the working memory and action selection at the bottom. So as visual input comes in, um, it, it goes through a series of, of stages that feed back on each other. And ultimately, 
as these stages are, are being progressed, this major uh, component down here of action selection is responsible for um, uh, tweaking uh, the knobs, if you will, on these white boxes. So these white boxes, think of them as little valves um, in the uh, pipeline of information that's flowing through the black lines here. Um, and the action selection, you can see the action selection box has access to all of the, um, to basically uh, tweak these little knobs and kind of open and close these little control valves that uh, cause um, information that has been processed in the section to flow through and eventually result in some action or activity um, of motor output. And uh, the working memory is described as being a place where um, the, all of these processes can store a little bit of information about what they're doing um, in order to coordinate with each other um, and in order to kind of work together and collaborate to uh, produce uh, desired motor output. Um, so again, the colors here correspond to the colors um, back here, and that's the, the map that, that, uh, that they're trying to make. And again, this is, this is uh, some of the intellectual contribution of this paper is to say that we think that it's, you know, it's a reasonable model that what these brain regions are doing are performing these functions and tasks. And, um, and I think that you know, fitting them together in a way that they all work together is what's really interesting about this, because while there have been theories proposed for each individual box, and there have been individual models of, of, of some of these pieces. Um, no one's really tried to fit them together in, in this kind of way. So I, I congratulate the authors for really kind of sticking their necks out and saying, like, you know, we're going to try and actually cobble these things together and make something that's a unified framework. I, I have a lot of respect for that. Um, let's see. Do we have anybody join us? No, not yet. OK. Hope that, hope that folks can join. OK, so then uh, the simulation movie. So for this, I'm going to try to. Um, play movie, um, and I'm going to hopefully have that shared out with folks in the channel. If anybody can have a look at YouTube and tell me if this is actually working, um, uh, folks obviously outside will, will see this, but um, hopefully this will work. So let's give it a shot. Okay. Um, there are a set of videos that are posted online that uh, accompany this um, the company this paper, and uh, the central example that uh, explains how the, you know, to get a sense of what the model does is this working memory task. So I've pulled out one of those videos, and, um, and uh, I'd like, I'm hopefully going to show that here in the channel. Um, if, uh, if not, if you folks can't see this, I recommend you go over to the website um, uh, that, uh, where the author is hosting these and try it out um, for yourself. Let me see if, um, if any of you guys can also post the link to this video, um, you guys here in the room, that'd be good. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to make it go, assuming that folks are gonna be able to see it. It lasts 45 seconds. If you can't see it, um, I'll, we'll be back in 45. So let's give it a shot. OK, so hopefully folks saw that. Um, if not, um, again, check it out. But basically, I'm just going to recap what it said um, using uh, this uh, figure. Actually, yeah. uh, presentation. OK, so basically what the movie was showing is this, this view of, of, the, of the picture. and. Um, so just to recap the boxes that we were showing before, OK, um, there's actually a few, uh, there's, there's fewer of them in the, that are represented by the movie than there are in the first uh, figure of the paper. So I've just kind of put back the, um, my, uh, my little diagrams here to kind of show what, what's going on. But basically, in, in this working memory task, 
um, what's happening is that um, that there is a visual input that's being represented by um, a set of pixels that's coming into what's processing the visual system, okay, and it's going through a through through a hierarchy of visual of visual processing. Processing the visual system, okay, and it's going through a okay. Hang on. All right, so I'm going to pause right there and uh, say hello to Chris, the author. Hey, Chris, can you say hi? Hello. How's it going? It's going well. Awesome. Great. It's great to see hey. you. I'm glad you're able to join us. Um, yeah, I'm glad you're doing this. This is great. So my pleasure. Um, actually, since you're on, I wanted to I wanted to get the chance. Here we go. Uh, you can see me. I just wanted to get the chance to say that I've actually followed your work for a while, and um, and some of your earlier work was inspirational to me uh, to actually go into studying uh, computational neuroscience. So oh, great. so seeing this paper come out has been very cool. Um, and uh, so we're kind of overviewing it, and um, I'm kind of in the, I don't know, probably about a third into uh, some of the slides. Yep. Um, all these folks here have also read the paper, uh, as you know, and so hopefully we'll be able to work out some of the, some of the deeper questions. Um, if there's anything that I, I misrepresent or don't um, explain well, please just jump in. Um, while I'm giving the slides, I can't really see the channel, so just go ahead and like, unmute yourself and, and talk. No, it's been great so far. I'm happy to be a fly on the wall, too. OK. All right, great. Well, it's, it's really awesome that you're, that you're joining. Um, and, and congrats on the paper. Um, yeah, thanks a lot. OK, good. So let's, uh, let's keep going. Um, OK, so, um, so like I said, there's sort of a reduced uh, set of um, brain regions that are showed in the movie, although I'm pretty sure all of the brain regions are actually um, operating while this is happening. But, as, I, as we were saying, so there's visual input that comes in, gets processed through the, through, through the visual system. And then these little bubbles that are popping out here are visualizations, essentially, of what are happening uh, under the hood inside of, of these areas. And what the movie is showing with the colors, by the way, is, um, is it's a particular visualization. I think it's, it's very cool because it kind of, it kind of uh, is reminiscent of what you see, what folks are st studying functional... Um, MRIs see when they're looking at the actual brain functioning um, that you see a projection of activity on top of the anatomy of the brain. To be clear, um, what's happening is that there is a network that is operating um, and the, um, the activity of those neurons are being turned into color patterns and those color patterns are then being overlaid on the part of this uh, cortex image that are um, corresponding to those brain regions. And it's really cool because um, in addition to seeing these little bubbles, which are showing you a visualization of the of uh, sort of the time series as things are happening, and there's and there's obviously a few different visual representations, um, you can also kind of get a qualitative feel for you know what's activated when across uh, you know uh, across the brain while it's while it's working. So there's a lot going on, and I actually find myself like pausing the video and unpausing the video to just kind of like to unpack all of the things that are happening simultaneously through here. But um, so visual input comes in. And um, it goes through uh, the processing, uh, the processing system that we were just uh, we were just seeing here. And eventually, when it comes out to motor output, there's this arm that's activated that's actually taking what uh, instructions are being created in motor cortex, and it's literally drawing in in space, which is also really cool um, because it's showing that you've gone not not just from some representation, uh, you know, of a number which you could represent really with like, you know. You could probably represent numbers of ten with like ten separate neurons. It's actually showing that there's a deeper pattern that's getting, you know, that that that's rich enough that you can actually draw this out. So, so, so Stephen, can you explain what e what's going on in each of these bubbles? Like what's being shown in like the bottommost bubble and what's being shown in like some of the other bubbles? Okay, um, so I'm I'll I'll try um, as we go, and obviously we'll get uh, you know we'll get Chris to to do the um, to do to do the best thing, I think that the details of every single visualization, I'm not sure, came out in um, you know in, in all the supplemental materials. But one of the main things that are being shown are uh, moving raster plots um, behind the scenes, and then what's popping up to the front, uh, especially when there are numbers that are popping up to the front, are kind of the higher level representations when that happened. Um, so I actually have some a slide to, to describe the rasters because I think it's it's important. I think you're probably familiar with the rasters. But um, but let me let me defer. Well, let me let me defer a detail that uh, you know digging in of, of every single bubble maybe to the discussion section just to not break up the flow. Um, but I will get into I will get into the raster part. Is that all right? 
Okay. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, cool. So then, just to, so this uh, so this the next figure just describes the process specifically for the working memory task to give you a sense again of the flow through the paper. So there's this image which represents a numeral, and that's a, a grid of pixels. And this is literally there's nothing about this um, input as it's coming in that says that it's a two to the computer. So so he's actually trained it up on a database of handwritten images that are just pixel values. So it's it's pretty equivalent to what you might see in some idealized retina. Um, and so um, the, the first set of visual processing is actually has been trained on these kinds of images and is able to go from just light dark values and turn that into um, a, a pattern that it is familiar with in order to then um, get up to the next level where there is something that actually knows this as a, a two. Okay, that actually knows this as a, the thing that you and I might think of as, as two. Okay, well, I mean, I, I don't want to go too far and to, to read into it, but as far as the system's concerned, it's the higher level node that um, that can then um, map out into um, a motor command. So then, um, after that, after it gets there, then we get up to DLPFC, which again is the, is the frontal cortex. And as as the um, way the trial works, there's this period where the image is presented. And then there is a delay, which means that the image stops being presented. And that means that, that you have to actually have a system that's capable of storing that representation in memory uh, for some period of time during that delay period. And then after that delay period happens, um, there is a prompt for the system to then take uh, what you were storing in memory and pull it out and transform it back into that two representation. So this should probably be identical to this. Um, but then. Um, we go one step further, which is that we unpack that into a motor program. Um, here the FP stand for firing pattern, which is um, also synonymous with a semantic pointer, um, which, is, which is basically, I think, Chris's way of describing you know, what a, a series of, of, of neurons are doing at a, at a particular stage, uh, how they're firing together at, at a moment in time to capture a dynamic activity pattern of information. And then that motor program is decompressed um, meaning that it's actually turned into, into instructions for this jointed arm to move and write. And, and that kind of information is, uh, again, not very much like a two that you and I are familiar with. That is like, what joint angle should my arm be at at what point in time? It, it's a very different kind of representation. So what's, what's cool about this working memory task is that it's, 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 a, it's a pretty good challenge for any system that wants to comprehensively describe um, a behavior because there's all these different places where information has to get transformed, information has to get like remembered, and then information has to get written, you know, back out again in, into a different form and drive things. So, so it's a it's a pretty pretty wise choice. Okay, then we get to this um, we get to this figure which uh, explains uh, in more detail what's happening dynamically inside the system. And before I before I dig into this too deeply, I do I do want to take a minute to talk about uh, rasters. Um, so I put this a little bit farther down in, in the deck, but I think it's important um, because I think everybody here is probably pretty comfortable with that, like in the room. But if you're watching and you're like, "Hey, what's this brain modeling stuff?" This is probably pretty intimidating. So let me just kind of explain real quick. So this is um, a figure pulled from the supplementals. Basically, if you, if if you this is a kind of a blow up of what you're seeing in here. These like fuzzy bars, right? If you if you're wondering what these fuzzy bars are and what they're meaning, they're pretty informative to a neuroscientist. Um, in, in, in what they're showing. The idea is that on the y-axis here, you have every single neuron laid out in your system, okay? And so it's like neuron zero, neuron one, neuron two, neuron three, neuron four, neuron five. So every row is the activity of a single neuron. And um, it's propagating over time. So time zero is over here, and it evolves as we go to the right. And uh, everywhere there's a dot, that's where there's a spike that's happened. And so what we're, what we're showing are the, are the readouts of these spiking neuron models that are at the foundation of the spawn architecture. And um, so what, do we, what can you tell from that? I mean, so typically what, what you do is you quantitate this and you, you sum it up, but, but neuroscientists, in, in neuroscience papers, folks actually like to see the rasters sometimes when they're doing multi-electrode recordings because you can see some uh, higher order patterns just by looking at these, at these dots. And so one pattern you know, that you can see right here is where there was sort of a, a stop in activity across all these neurons at the same time. Um, and so that's showing something significant is happening here. 
Um, and then you can also just see relatively just by eye when it, when it's darker and when, meaning that there's more dots and they're all closely put together, um, as we'll see um, in, the, in the other figure, that's showing that like all those neurons were really excited and they were all activating at the same time. So, um, so here's here's the serial uh, working memory task. And again, so across the so this reads from top to bottom, and again it kind of follows the same order that we've been describing, where we've got visual and temporal cortex, we've got basal ganglia. Again, that's responsible for the action selection and the and the go no go part. Um, we've got prefrontal um, and frontal cortex, which is aggregating information together um, and uh, and then able to um, help to ship commands back out to motor cortex, which then uh, results in a, in a motion of an arm, and that's happening here. So the stimulus comes in. So this is showing what's being presented as images to the eye at each stage, and so we kind of think of this loosely as a flow downwards. Of course, actually, there's a lot of things happening back and forth between these systems as well, but largely you can think of it as going from in to out. Um, so the way this works is that um, the A comes and initializes the, the system. The three actually uh, tells the system that it's going to be doing a working memory task. So all the tasks, I think there's there's seven tasks that the, the, the spawn performs. They're all numbered from zero to seven. And so when it gets a three, it's kind of telling the system, now it's time to do working memory. And then uh, this says, OK, get ready to get input uh, from uh, that, that uh, will be part of relevant to the task. OK? And then now we're, we're presented numerals. And, and the idea of the, the working memory task is that you're going to hold on to all the numbers that I give you. Uh, and then I'm going to not show you those numbers anymore, so you won't see them again. And you're just responsible for reading them back again. Okay? So I show you four. I show you, so I show you four. You don't do anything. I show you three. You don't do anything. I show you two. You don't do anything. I show you six. You don't do anything. And then I say, okay, what did I show you? And then you write out four, three, two, six. If you're doing the task correctly. And I can show you. And so you can do this with one number. You can do it with seven numbers. Um, you can do it with all sorts of, uh, you know, of numbers. But that's the basic task. So you know, for a human being, it's you know, we can pretty much do this. Um, you know, folks like to say, or it's a commonly thought thing that, you know, you tend to have about seven spaces in your working memory, which is, you know, also some people say that's why phone numbers in the U.S. anyway tend to have seven digits because it's just about as many as you can remember. I don't know if that's, I don't know if that's uh, entirely true, but, but that anyway is a, is a way to think about, like, what working memory is about. It's like if you, somebody told you a phone number and you wanted to hang on to it before you wrote, wrote it down, um, you'd be using working memory. Okay, so again, underneath we've got these fuzzy plots, and that's those rasters. And so what's that, what that's showing you is that IT is composed of a series of spiking neuron models from zero to however many are represented in here. And we're really zoomed out, so we really, I don't, the point of this is not to show you the individual dots, but the point is to show you that activity is happening and, that I, and how activity is changing as we go through time. And obviously in, in the y-axis we're, uh, we're going across in time um, from zero to four uh, to five seconds at the end here. And so as input comes into IT, this is creating a pattern in visual and, and, and temporal cortex. Uh, basal ganglia is processing this. There's a lot of activity being shown in this piece of basal ganglia, um, a representation of the globus pallidus internal, for those of you into your neuroanatomy. Um, and um, not much is happening at all in PFC at this point. Um, a little bit in the, the DL PFC, so this is, again, a, a prefrontal cortex and something called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Um, and, and what we have down here in this graph is, um, as far as I understand, it is, it is a quantitation or a summary of what we're seeing in the DLPFC raster. Um, and, and so it's kind of showing you a summary of what's happening in, um, you know, in, in this particular system during these time points. Um, ultimately, when we get out here, this is the motor cortex and the motor output, and you'll see that that's going to be more active as we go down further. So this, so we just kick things off. Um, we say we're going to kick ourselves into um, the working memory uh, program, and there's activity which um, I guess is is going to be responsible for tuning those knobs that we that we saw before. So again, the action selection, the basal ganglia is being responsible for this action selection. The knobs. Uh, that I'm talking about are, are represented by these white boxes, and so the idea is that in the period where we've said, you know, for one thing that we're going to do, um, you know, working memory task. My what I'm thinking is that that's happening here is that we're 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 putting these guys into a state so that these uh, subsystems are going to talk to each other in a particular way 
that they might not talk to each other in a particular way if we weren't doing working memory. So um, let me go back. Okay. So that happens, and then we're prompted by this guy, which says, get ready for the numbers. Okay, and now we're in the process of having to lay down uh, in the prefrontal cortex some patterns that are going to be distinct for each of these numbers so that we can hold on to them. Okay, and so we've got 4, 3, 2, 6. They come in. We've got the visual uh, pattern. If you look really closely, you can see that the visual pattern for each of these numbers is a little bit different. Okay, just in terms of the stripes, I think you might have to... I mean, I don't know if this will be visible on YouTube, but you, if you get the paper, you might zoom up on it. But you can actually see that, like, kind of like a barcode, right? There's different activity patterns for each of these visual uh, representations. Um, basal ganglia looks like it's pretty much doing the same stuff, uh, you know, I, I, as far as I can tell visually here. Um, prefrontal cortex, though, you can see is also kind of doing something fairly different for each of these for each of these numbers. If you, again, if you look at the striping, um, which you know would would appear to be responsible for holding on to some uh, additive state. So you'd imagine that um, here, uh, the prefrontal cortex is only holding on to 4, but here it has to hold on to the combination of 4 and 3. Here it has to hold on to the combination of 4, 3, and 2. And here it has to hold on to 4, 3, 2, and 6. And then it has to hold on to that, right? And then we get the prompt for questioning. We see activity pattern happening in the basal ganglia again, right? Suggesting that, again, what the action selection system is doing is that it's tweaking the knobs and saying, okay, we were, we were doing our recording, and now we're going to go to motor output. So now let's take what we got stored up there, and let's push it out to the arm. And so now we kick in the motor cortex, which has pretty much not been doing anything up until then. And, um, and we've got the 4, 3, 2, 6 that come out afterwards. Um, and it's interesting to me that it's actually, I mean, so... Visual cortex is not doing anything at that point, and that's as you would expect it because there's no more visual input that it's so it's not it doesn't actually see I guess what its arm is doing. Um, uh, basal ganglia is probably got to be doing something uh, as well, but looks fairly static here, and the and the prefrontal cortex is also fairly static. So I guess the inference is that we've basically taken the whole representation that we stored up in in DLPFC and we've shipped it down to motor cortex, and now it's just it's just activating on it and. Um, and so I think what's happening here, uh, what we're seeing in these activity patterns with this is that the 4 is being compressed into um, a pattern, the 3 is being compressed as well, then the 2 and then the 6, and what you have is a resulting activity pattern or firing pattern, I guess, um, for all, uh, all four of them put together, which then results in that. Anybody want to make any comments uh, at this point? Yeah, can I just elaborate on what you were just saying about the working memory encoding? Yeah. Yeah. So um, yeah. So we were talking about this a, lot, um, a little bit last night and just trying to figure out exactly what's happening in DLPFC um, because this is like the kind of key part of how is how he uh, stores these things into memory and like how you can store multiple items into memory. Mm -hmm. And so like he goes in in the supplemental about this circle X operator, which he calls a circular convolution. Yep. Right. And so. Um, the way he you keep the numbers into working memory and you keep them in a particular order, which is also important, is by uh, you do this circular convolution with the representation of the number. So like the IT has this representation of four that gets sent to DLPFC, and you do this convolution with the position. And so this convolution binds like some position vector with the representation vector, and then that gets stored into DLPFC. And then as you put more things into memory, you're actually just summating these combined vectors. And so, so like you can see how um, at, at the end, once all four numbers are in D DLPFC, like it stay, the stripes stay pretty constant. And they stay constant throughout um, the process of when it's drawing the numbers, right? Yeah. Exactly. And so it must be that somehow the basal ganglia is dereferencing the uh, DLPFC by like Subtracting, pulling out P1, and and then getting the, the information in P1, right? Yeah, I'm maybe maybe let me turn over Chris. I do talk a little bit about um, about the framework, about the neural uh, engineering framework, just to kind of introduce it. I don't really go so much into the circular convolution. So I don't know if you want to make a like a high level comment in response, Chris. Sure. So I think uh, the description that he gave was exactly right. Basically, 
you have these uh, this operator circular convolution. I think the most intuitive way to think about it is just multiplication. So basically, some operator that's not addition. Um, and the difference between it and addition is when you uh, convolve two vectors together, they are very unlike either of the vectors that you put into the convolution. Uh, in response to the question about uh, how do we decode the information, you're exactly right. There is another part of the model which isn't reflected in the spike rasters. It's part of the information decoding system, which um, cycles through the position vectors, uh, which is actually fairly straightforward to do, and unbinds each position vector with whatever is currently in working memory. Once that item is unbound, it's taken out of the working memory, and then uh, the process continues. Cool. Hi. Uh, while we're talking about this working memory, yeah. I was wondering if, you know, I think one of the very interesting things here, I'm an experimental neuroscientist, mostly, uh, one of the really interesting things you've done with this working memory system is to actually create two different dorsolateral prefrontal cortices, right? Two different DLPFCs with different time scales of representation, different time constants. And we can't actually see that here in the serial working memory task, but that becomes very important when we, be, we start asking the model to do more complicated tasks like the Raven's progressive matrices task, right? I mean, in the world, you're constantly having to compare, um, you know, two different concepts, right? And so what they've done, instead of just using one kind of monolithic, soupy um, working memory structure or recurrent attractor neural network, is they've actually divided uh, the system up into two different recurrent attractor networks. And then they have a, another level acting on the output of those two. And so this is really interesting to me because I wonder, Chris, um, how you think this might be implemented in the brain. As experimental neuroscientists, we tend to think that the prefrontal cortex is just this one big you know, recurrent attractor that has you know, a ton of states because it has so many different networks. But I think you have this really interesting idea that there's some value that comes from um, actually having subnetworks <laughs> because everything isn't actually connected to everything else. And I wonder if you could maybe just comment on how many different DLPFCs you really think there are in the real human brain, for instance, um, and yeah, what that uh, second stage of readout might be, if that question makes sense. OK, I, uh, I'll have to apologize, because actually I had a student just come to my door. Um, <laughs> yeah, but I did fine. hear the end of the question. Um, and I don't have an answer to the question of how many DLPFCs do I think, or how many uh, essentially, attractor networks do I think you would need in frontal cortex to uh, explain the kinds of cognitive phenomena that people can uh, give rise to. We, in our model, have on the order of eight um, different attractor networks which are being used, uh, essentially. And they're even used slightly to do di slightly different kinds of information processing. So some are uh, strictly me memories, like that one. Uh, some are very high dimensional memories, like the working memory that we talk about. But actually, the PFC trace is a much lower dimensional memory because it's keeping track essentially of just which task you're in or which part of the task you're in. So it's not as complicated of a representation. Uh, and we have other ones which are actually they're performing a similar operation, another kind of integration, but they're essentially, I don't know what a good way of expressing it is, but uh, averaging across all of the information that's been presented to them in order to try to extract the transformation that is consistent across all the data that's been shown so far. So, yeah, I, I definitely think there are lots of different subnetworks. Um, when you think there are a lot of subnetworks, you begin to really focus on issues of control. So, how do you put the right information into the right place, extract the right information, and so on? And for us, the basal ganglia is doing a lot of that. Um, but we definitely don't have a definitive answer as to something like how many there are. Sure. Yeah, I think it's just almost a profound concept, especially for the RPM task. The idea that you actually have different subnetworks with different delays caring about different time scales, different time constants, as you describe it, which right. I think is, is rather a profound computing concept. So, yeah, ahead, we hope Steven. so. I'm trying to push it. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Sorry, Stephen. Thanks. Yeah, no problem. Actually, this is a good time for any other questions as well, um, because I, I think uh, understanding this part is, is the heart of pulling all those pieces together um, that I've talked about already. Um, any, any questions here? Yeah, so um, Chris, is there a sense in which you can calculate the capacity of the working memory, or the, the number of things that can be stored in working memory for Spawn? 
um, like, can you store more things with more neurons, or is there like a fundamental limit to that? Oh, I see. So, right, in the model that we have there, uh, essentially that graph that was shown earlier that showed, you know, how much error you make with how many items you have is a working, it's a capacity graph. And so when you build graphs like that, we show that, you know, the me memory that we have in there right now is kind of like humans. So you can show the system 40 items, but it gets all the ones in the middle wrong and just gets the either end right, um, above chance, that is. So like humans, it's basically, you know, 7 plus or minus 2-ish. Uh, really, those graphs have more detail than that. If you wanted to increase the capacity, you're right, actually. You could increase the number of cells significantly, increase the dimensionality of the space that you're representing, and then you'll be able to cram more stuff into that space. Yeah, so if you wanted to increase, if you wanted to make this capacity like 10, 10 things, would you need like exponentially more neurons, or would you just need like additively more neurons? Um, I don't know the answer to this question for the working memory case. So um, you actually get an exponential increase in capacity as you add the number of dimensions. And the number of neurons that we have is a linear function of the number of dimensions that you add. Um, but uh, the working memory representations are slightly more sophisticated than that computation. So it should be approximately exponential in the number of cells. But uh, I don't think, like in practice, I don't think that's actually the case. OK, just thanks. Cool. OK, uh, let's, um, let's I have oh, a yeah. question, actually, about the working memory, since we're on that topic. Yes, yes. Uh, so, yeah. and I apologize if this was uh, covered earlier. I joined late. Oh, no um, is the uh, working memory, is this a, is it a spiking recurrent network, uh, something like a liquid state machine or echo state network? Um, and if so, uh, what prevents the items from interfering with each other? Uh, so, it is a recurrent spiking attractor network. It is not like a liquid state machine insofar as the approach typically taken there is to randomly connect, connect a lot of neurons together and then uh, try to find a linear readout that will let you extract the dynamics that you want. So instead, when we construct our networks, we essentially optimize the what they would call the liquid as well as determining the way of uh, reading the information out. Um, what prevents the neurons from interfering essentially is uh, increasing the dimensionality. So I actually, in, as I was finishing my last comment, I should note that the, the uh, exponential increase is basically in the size of the space that's available, but actually having stable dynamics in that space is difficult. So even like if we could change the weights, uh, then we could put an exponential amount of information in the space. But since the weights have to stay fixed, uh, what really is constraining is how long can you make those things stick around before they disappear. So you're kind of, you know, uh, sort of virtually loading in these new vectors into this memory. Um, and in so doing, you have to try to use this very noisy uh, substrate of spiking neurons in order to keep that information stable. And the amount of noise and the dimensionality of the space makes it actually quite difficult to keep that sort of thing stable for a really long period of time. And so when a, when a new item is loaded in, is there a process for loading a new item into memory, or uh, is it just um, the, the new activity bumps something else that's weaker? No, there's definitely a process. So when something new is loaded in, the memory is essentially, uh, so the, the time constant of decay is uh, decreased. So basically everything slips out. So you essentially erase the memory, and then you put the memory time constant back up to what it was before. So this is all the control issues I was talking about before, right? So then you put it back up, and then you can start loading new things in. And every time you uh, want to essentially completely erase the memory, uh, you're, so you're done with it, you want to flush it, then you have to do this control on the time constant to get rid of what was there and put it something and uh, sort of allow it to be loaded up again. Mm -hmm. So there is a lot of control that the basal ganglia is doing in the background in order to let you uh, sort of remember things and then forget what you knew before so you can put something new in and so on. I see. Yeah. Thanks. Cool. So um, just keeping with the, the thread then, um, you know, the presentation, I've, I've, I've moved up this figure, uh, which comes a little bit later in the paper, just because it's also related to um, working memory, um, where there's a comparison between the performance of the model to uh, some data from humans in doing, in, in doing working memory. And um, it's and and so the paper cites um, that there's that you can see a primacy and a recency effect 
uh, primacy being that things which you learned earlier are um, uh, you remember better. The first thing that you remember, you remember better, and things that you remember that uh, come later, um, you have more trouble remembering. And also, um, uh, the number of items that you have kind of have an impact on your accuracy. And I think that's mainly what you're showing here, Chris. Is is that you have um, is that the features of the way that learning happens are um, there's a featural relationship rather than trying to make a strong like quantitative claim here. I, I, am I right about that? Sorry, I muted myself. Um, <laughs> uh, so this is a tricky question. Um, I actually had graphs that matched the model better than the data that's here. Yeah. And I didn't use them because this data actually matches the task the closest of any of the data that I could find. OK. Uh, so um, we have another paper that actually describes the, or we're working on a, another paper, I should say. There's a thesis that describes this working memory model in more detail. And in that instance, we have lots of graphs, and the match is really, really close. Um, in this instance, I thought it was sort of more honest in a way to try to find tasks where humans had been asked to do this working memory task extremely quickly, and things were shown for a very brief period of time, which matches sort of what we're doing with the model. Mm -hmm. um, and so I was actually a little bit surprised at how poorly it did on the seven items, but you know, <laughs> luckily they didn't make us redo the model. So I will kind of at this point have to say, yes, it's the main features we're after, but really the quantitative fit uh, is typically much better when we do comparisons to data. OK, OK, yeah. I'm, so that's good to know and, and a good reference to, to that additional paper to check out some of the more, some of the more detailed um, the quantitative bits as well. So it's good to know. Um, OK, so I wanted to then um, kind of explain a summary, at least of the way I was seeing it. And again, it's really good to have Chris here, because now I'm kind of I'm kind of going from what I was reading into the paper to try to understand a little bit about where this fits in for those of us who follow like models, the models of neurons. Um, and so my understanding of the way this this broke down was that Spawn is the um, is is the is the big picture. It's a unified architecture. And then those there's individual boxes that we were just seeing. I'm I'm calling them brain function models. That's not that's not his term. Um, but these are the parts that have you know the different action selection, working memory. And so this is, for, for those of you in computers, this is sort of like a stack, which is to say that everything up here is built on all the things that are below it. And so what is underneath all those function models um, are sort of a, a way of building up uh, those boxes that is called the semantic pointer architecture, um, which um, uh, so each of the individual items there are known as semantic pointers or firing patterns. Okay, and that's then that is then implemented on top of, again, a framework called the Neural, neural Engineering Framework. Um, and this is uh, detailed in, in Chris's 2003 book with, uh, with Charles Anderson. And the idea then of what the framework does, OK, is that this is also not still not, um, or the way I'm thinking about it anyway, um, what you do is you aren't necessarily designing a neural network at this stage. What you are doing is you are designing a representation using um, using the kind of data that you want to store and how many dimensions you want to store it in and the relationships between uh, information stored in basically you know, matrices. Um, and then what the neural engineering framework lets you do is to convert that into a network, a, a network of integrate and fire neurons. And that connectivity then is defined by rules uh, as specified by the neural engineering framework. So this is, I think, important for those of you looking at the paper sort of in a, in a, in a cursory way, not understanding the connection between how the the neurons are, are constructed, because it's it's actually this is you know so Neff is is one of Chris's I think big contributions, um, and and he's um, you know a lot of the work that has been done over the last several years and the other publications have been uh, pushing this framework to as a you know as a rational way to uh, describe you know um, how neurons can come together, and I think it's one of the more interesting things. It's also I think you know still a major hypothesis as to you know, how well, you know, or, or for how many parts of brain you could apply, say, the, the neural engineering framework. But I wanted to just kind of um, put that in a little bit in context as well. So at the bottom of the, at the bottom of this scale, right, are these integrated fire neurons. And again, trying to put into context uh, where this goes. So once you've compiled down your description of what a functional model can do into, in, into, into those neurons, um, what, what you have is a model of sort of integrated fire. And that's kind of up here in this continuum. This actually comes not from the paper, but from 
Eugene Zakevich uh, in 2004, who did a summary of these sorts of things. And I just wanted to highlight for those of you who are really in the know and sort of the, the, the weeds of computational neuroscience, right? So something like a Hodgkin-Huxley model that's focused on ionic channels and conductances is sort of all the way down here. And this graph that Zakevich put together I thought was very helpful because, you know, it, both sh it, it kind of shows why, you know, integrated and fire neurons can be the right thing to use because they're extremely efficient when it comes to implementation costs. But just to point out as well that, you know, in, there are features of, of the biology that are kind of left out because it's intended to focus on a particular way in which neurons are, you know, are doing uh, information processing, which is that spikes are being read out in response to, um, you know, pattern recognition that's, that's coming in. Yes, so, that's, yeah. That graph kind of shows why his, his own model is the best. <laughs> why, which one? Oh, is it Kavich? Yeah. <laughs> Well, I, I know that Isakevich is, yeah, he, he uses this to make an argument in his, in his um, you know, in his paper that, like, yeah, the Isakevich model is the sweet spot, right? But, um, but I don't think that it's, I mean, if you look at the criterion that he uses to uh, build this up, I think it's actually pretty reasonable and pretty even-handed. Um, so I, I don't think he's, like, stacking the deck to just make it come out. So that, I mean, he's saying that his stuff is, like, has some good biological plausibility and makes it, like, kind of efficient, right? So I mean that's that's kind of his argument, but um, but I you know I think that obviously there's a lot of papers that come out all the time down here and there's papers that come out up here. So really I'm just trying to show um, not good or bad, but just show like the landscape and kind of what it looks like. Can I make a quick comment? Yeah. So uh, I think that's actually a nice graph, and his point is well taken. Lots of people use his neuron for exactly this reason. Um, of course, people like Markram would be entirely dismissive of every single neuron model on there, right, because they're all point neurons. And so, you know, the Blue Brain Project, he was happy to say of that spawn model, it's not a brain model, entirely because we used point neurons. Um, so that's one comment. And then the other, I would uh, note that actually in our NEF book, we use all of these different kinds of neurons, well, or at least at, all the way across both ends of the scale, and show that the methods work um, regardless of where you are on the scale. But the prohibitive uh, computation is basically what stopped us from using in something of the scale of this model. Yeah. So, so that's a really great point. And um, so I think, I mean, so I, I take this, if you think of where Markram is, I, I do think of him here because he's sort of using Hodgkin-Huxley plus multi-compartmental neurons. And, and obviously, he doesn't necessarily think. So this, this sense of being actually literally prohibitive, I think, is, is not true. It's just that it's very you know, computationally intensive. Um, but to your other comment about whether it is or isn't a, a brain model, um, so you know, as I've been trying to present throughout this whole um, thing, this this you know this talk, what I'm really trying to do is is try to put this in context of other of other brain models, and it is a brain model, obviously, because it's a model of features of the brain. Um, as it turns out, modeling the human brain is such a huge space that there are many different pieces of the landscape that uh, are reasonable for somebody to go after, because nobody has the you know the full picture. So um, so um, I think that you know there are like we're like all of these different projects are worthy and they're all um, getting at something important. Um, and my point here is just to show like where this does fit in, in you know into that. And I think that you know um, if you want to approach anything cognitive, um, you know, and you want to have neurons like in 2012, <laughs> there's there's just no way you're going to go all the way down here first, right? But we would hope that it's at some day, right? What we, you know, what you do to try and break down what the cognitive thing is doing into point neurons, and then what folks are coming up from really detailed models of neurons are doing to try and get at cognition from the other direction. I mean, that's your, that's your, you know, top down and bottom up, you know, coming together. So I think that um, I think there's a wide space for all of us to play. I, I don't believe in a battle royale of uh, brain models where only one, only one can win, or like the Highlander model. Like I don't, I don't think that's that's got to be the way, right? I think that there's value in, in all these different models, and you know they all need to proceed forward, and they all have something good to say. Yeah, I would add to that that um, one of the uh, issues is uh, what it is that uh, you're wanting to understand with the model. And if what you want to understand is ion channels, then you need something like uh, Markram's model. But if what you want to understand is um, how the brain processes information and um, can compute and how it works cognitively, then you have to go with a higher level model. Otherwise, all you've got are trees and you can't see the forest. So I think this kind of approach um, that uh, they're taking here makes a lot of sense. I would be happy to have Markram's computer. <laughs> <laughs>
because I think we could take his million neurons and you know construct something that actually does functions with a million cells. So wow. I'm a bit jealous too. I must admit. That's kind of the thing about these kind of models is it's like you, you want to use the models that have the features that you want. So like it's not necessarily necessary to model all of these features like bursting or adaptation when it doesn't really fit into the overall framework, right? So like if integrate and fire is suitable for your whole system, then you can use it as a better approximation. I, absolutely. Um, so um, I, I clipped some of these out of the, the Neural Engineering Framework uh, book just to kind of um, explain um, you know, some of those things. I think actually this picture though is probably a better way to get started. And so if you read, if you read the supplementals uh, section, there's, there's a lot that goes into this. But, um, uh, but I, I only have this figure here just to kind of explain the, the high level ideas of it. But it's kind of important just to bridge together with, with the other bit of work. Um, so if your goal, right, is to, is to capture the representation of something moving in, um, you know, in two dimensions, which is this, this C part here, this X1 and X2 vector, and you've got something moving around a circle, which you can represent with a sinusoid, also, you know, you can see that here, you can capture that with, you, you, you can capture two dimensions using four neurons by decomposing this input signal into a series of spike trains like this. And what that, what that means in terms of what your neurons have to have is that they have to have these overlapping um, uh, sensitivity areas, these overlapping uh, what we call in neuroscience receptive fields, so that um, you, when the part of the signal that you're interested in is in that area, you have enough coverage of, um, uh, you know, of, of that point being in, in that area so that the neuron can fire, which is to say if you're at zero degrees here, you've got neuron one and neuron two that can fire, uh, but neuron two will fire a little bit less. Uh, neuron one will just be kind of reaching its peak, um, and you can see that the peaks here are different. So basically what, what the neural engineering framework sort of presents is this idea that uh, we can take, um, you know, neurons, um, spiking neurons, and we can apply a method um, that for whatever representation we're interested in capturing, in this case it's just this two-dimensional uh, point moving around a circle, but, uh, you know, could be uh, a visual space or it could be, you know, some memory at some, at some time, that um, I can find you the system of neurons and, and the right number of neurons that adequately capture the representation that you want to um, create. And I, think, I think that's the basic idea of this. Um, so what that lets you do in some ways is that when you're designing a system to do information processing, you don't tinker with the details of, um, of the neurons directly. You, you work at a higher level, and then um, there is a method to convert this into, into this. Does that, do, I, 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 I hope, Chris, that I'm not completely butchering the idea, but is that kind of it at a high level? Yep. <laughs> okay. So I have to find my mute button. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Okay, good. So that's, you know, so that's pretty interesting, and, and that's also something that, um, you know, I, I think not everybody in computational neuroscience gets exposed to. Um, as is, is this idea, so, um, but I, I've actually owned this book for a while and so I've been familiar with it and I think that what's interesting about what you've assembled here as a whole is to really, you know, this is interesting in and of itself as a, th as a theory of, you know, a, a rational way to approach engineering uh, neurons. What's interesting as well is, is all of the systems now that you've built on top of this, which then, because I think that, you know, ultimately, right, what you, what the payoff is is that you can make a picture like this where you're going from what are cognitive, you know, inputs and, uh, you know, motor, or excuse me, what are visual inputs and, and motor outputs, but you also have these rasters and you can see kind of what's happening across there. And without, I think, that, um, that means of designing the networks, um, it'd be very hard to, uh, it'd be hard to have a picture that really shows you that, that scope. So that's, I think, one of the powerful things about this. Now, obviously, there are things about this which are, you know, um, which, which are assumptions, which is to say that, you know, I, I don't think anyone would, would presume that, you know, there's a divine creator that literally used a neural engineering framework when one built the brain. Um, it is a rational approach to going about, you know, designing systems that deal with this, and um, there are a lot of uh, correspondences between what comes out and what you can see, you know, in, in, um, in the neuron firing, but, um, but there are folks who would come back and say that, 
the details of the dynamics of these cells will matter a lot. Um, and you know, you talk a little bit in in um, in there about um, going about how you can go from the nonlinear system into a set of linear, uh, you know, decoders um, as a reasonable way to process, um, you know, information. And um, you know, I think so. I think a lot of that bears itself out quite well in terms of building a system that that performs as you were as you were able to show in this paper. Um, but again, for everyone, you know, everyone uh, understanding when I was starting at the beginning. And I was, um, you know, I was laying out these different levels, right? I mean, there are folks, um, you know, and I've certainly built models at this level as well, who think a lot about the details of, the, you know, the, the actual functions that are used here at the synapse level and the microcircuits. Paul actually mentioned, you know, this, this liquid state idea, which is also sort of a different way of initializing weights, uh, you know, than this. And that's sort of the strongest contrast. But again, I, I don't believe in a, in a battle royale of these methods. I think that they all have their place, and I think that you've been able to show something really interesting, kind of making these, um, you know, building this system for grappling with nonlinear, uh, uh, the nonlinearity and, and turning it into something that can, can solve an information processing task. Can, can I make a quick comment on the... Yeah, yeah, please. <laughs> yeah, so this is something that actually I've, I'm thinking I need to write a paper about because, um, you know, a number of people, when I present the work, they say things like, oh, it's all hardwired or something along those lines, suggesting that the methods that we use for some reason are not as good as if we had learned the network. So the, the comment I make about this usually is I say, well, thing number one is actually we could learn all of these networks. We have a learning rule which we can take and you know stick in the middle of, we, we can't learn it in the context of a whole brain, but we could take you know a bunch of neurons and say, I want to make a working memory okay, here's the learning rule I need. Now I can run it over time and wait and be really patient, and then all my um, connection weights get tuned up so I now have a working memory. Um, and in a way, this is, I think, what the standard method for building these networks is. Right? You have an optimization method, which is learning a learning rule, your favorite learning rule. You use that optimization method in some network that's been sort of ripped out of uh, where it would actually be in the biological system. You find weights, and then you're happy to go on your way. Um, and that seems to count as learning. But what we're doing here is essentially an identical process. Right? We're taking networks. We have a hypothesis about what the function is. And we have an optimization method, which happens to be a global one and a very efficient one. Um, but it's still an optimization method, just like a learning rule is. And then we learn it out of context, and we put it back into context. And it's, I'm always a bit, you know, I don't know what the right word is. Uh, disappointed or something when somebody says, oh, yours is just hardwired, but these other ones, uh, you know, they were learned. Well, in fact, you know, they're in a way cheating in exactly the same way that we're cheating. Taking things out of context, um, choosing, so in, in uh, learning, often you have to be very careful about how you, what data you present and what order you present the data in and all this kind of stuff. We don't have to have some of those worries. Um, but, you know, then we're both running our favorite optimization and building network. Um, so I think that the real challenge of learning is to say, how do you learn these systems in the context of a that whole brain, right? That's a much more difficult problem than saying, okay, I can learn a working memory. Yeah. Um, so I agree that we're using an optimization method, which we don't think that God came along and said, okay, you know, I'm going to now use the NEF to determine what the connection weights are. Um, but I think what we're doing is essentially as bad in many ways as what everybody does when they build models of this sort. Yeah, I, I agree. And I, I hope you don't take anything I said to, to imply you know, anything dismissive. Um, and I and I and I don't know that even being hardwired, you know, or being learned is, you know, even the the strongest criteria for evaluating, you know, the quality of the model. I think there's actually room for for both. I mean, for example, like the C. elegans uh, synaptic pattern is pretty conserved, and one might say that's hardwired. And I and uh, you know, I've I've taken some time to to look into what's interesting about that as a system for you know for processing information too. So I think that all these things are again. Um, there's there's enough uh, <laughs> uncertainty about how the brain works that I think that um, there's plenty of room for us all to, to come out, and I think this is as valuable an idea um, as any other. So, um, so I do appreciate that clarification. Um, so we're kind of starting to run low on time. There are two other tasks that are included um, in the uh, in the paper in terms of the, the main manuscript or the figures. Um, this one was one that's presented um, in, in in the in the context of the narrative to explain how this is not just working memory is not the only thing that the system does uh, and that it, and actually it's capable of doing many different things. Um, the copy drawing task being the one where again the stimulus is presented, uh, you get the zero which uh, kicks the system into doing copy drawing. 
um, meaning that the basal ganglia is now um, you know putting that uh, plan into place. Uh, then you get your input, uh, which is two, and then you're prompted to just write a two. Uh, no, in this case, no delay. There's no um, there's no uh, separate one. There's no separate um, uh, set of uh, no no sequence, I guess. Um, but you just sort of write that. And uh, what this shows is that it can do that. And uh, and I and what's interesting as well is that you're going a loop from uh, you know this pattern of light and dark here again. Nothing too nothing two about it as you and I might think of it. It's just like a bunch of pixels as far as the thing goes when it comes in. And what we get out is this arm motion, which is a series of uh, you know joint angles over time. And uh, over here it shows a, a bunch of um, comparisons of what went in and, and, and what came back out again on the left and the right for uh, all the numerals. So that's, that's to show the flexibility of it. Uh, and then we get to the RPM task. And um, although I think I'm still trying, I'm still really digging into getting to the higher level of insight of how it is that this is able to carry this out. And actually, I'm really glad that Chris is here to maybe give me like, you know, uh, an, an intuition into the back and forth that happens here. But, um, but just so that folks understand what the task is, at least the construct, um, again. I, I, can I interrupt a, just for a brief second about the previous task? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So I don't, I don't want to extend things more. But uh, oh, okay. the, the point of this task actually is that uh, it not only recognizes the number, but it actually copies the um, structure of what it's seeing. So there's another task where it just does recognition. So if it sees a 2, it writes a 2. The thing that's interesting about the letters on or the numbers on the right hand side is that it's what it produces actually looks similar to what it's shown. So if if you look at the two twos, you know one has a straight bottom, one has a loopy bottom. So it's actually capturing some of these low level visual properties um, and being able to represent that kind of detail, which is something that is often missing does from the, other cognitive uh, tasks. So does this copy drawing task is it robust to other um, just doodles or is it is it still within the semantic framework that gets established at the at the higher levels? Yeah, this is a good question. So it actually employs its knowledge of numbers. So it basically recognizes it as a two, and then it sort of notices what the distortions are on that on its sort of handwritten template, and then it introduces those distortions when it tries to write it. So its previous knowledge is affecting how it draws. Yeah. Yeah, no, so that, that is important. Yeah, it's actually capturing some sense of the path of the, the pixels here and turning that into a, a motor plan without, without the concept that it knows what a 2 is at all. Yeah. Cool. OK, so on this one, um, so we go to 7, which is the RPM task. The RPM task uh, works um, like this. It's a, it's a generalization. So I'm going to give you a pattern. In this case, I'm going to give you a 1, and then I'm going to now show you a separate pattern, which is two ones. And I'm going to show you another pattern again, which is three ones. Again, this is all happening in sequence. And then I'm going to show you four. And then I'm going to show you two fours. And then I'm going to show you three fours. Okay. And then I'm going to show you five. Okay, now, now we get to the sort of the prompt, uh, which is I'm going to show you five, I'm going to show you two fives, and it's up to you to figure out what the pattern was in the first two and respond appropriately which is three fives. So what the system then is doing is that it's, it's, got, it's got the concept that we have a pattern in sequence of you know, increasing numbers of things. Um, uh, but it's not that it, the special thing is not that they are either ones or fours. The special thing is that they are this increasing pattern of things. And when we get to here, to the end, uh, it knows that it's supposed to take the same pattern that we have here um, but reproduce it, you know, three times. So I'm curious, uh, you know, for, for some intuition of this and how, uh, you know, how much this particular mode you think generalizes or how much it would need to generalize. Um, yeah. So, I mean, first of all, can I present, can I, how, how much can I push this pattern, for example? Can I, can I do this with, like, three, three does that work? Um, sorry, I didn't hear the, what was the, can you do it with what, sorry? Could I say, like, have three ones, then two ones, then a single one? Yeah, it does that pattern. OK, so it goes backwards. Yeah, it will do, it actually can employ its knowledge of numbers. So you can do, like, one, two, three, five, six, seven, two, four, what? Or, I mean, two, three, what? Yeah. Uh, it can do skips of numbers. Like, so if you go two, four, six, stuff like that. Um, we we haven't know. fully explored the possibilities. Uh, so things that it can't do would be. 
No, Recursive sure. grammars. Well, yeah. Okay, yeah. But I, those are hard to express. So <laughs> at, the, the, at the high end. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The, the thing that it, uh, that it has to be constrained, so you sh show it three things only, right? So you only have three things to express your pattern. And you have to show the three things twice. So you can't express a recursive grammar <laughs> with three digits. So, so you don't actually have to design a different network. So the same network design can do the one, two, like one, one, two, ones, three, ones completion and say three, four, five, yeah. six, seven, eight, that sort of thing? Or do you have to, for each algorithm, for each heuristic that's producing the next number in the sequence, you have to kind of design a different network structure to do that? No, it's the former. So it has a general method for actually doing induction, right? What it's trying to do is it's basically comparing the first two things it sees and the second two things it sees. It's trying to infer what the transformation is that gets you from thing one to thing two. And then um, it does that for the next set of examples. And it averages, remember I was talking about we have a working memory which kind of acts like an average. This is where it's employed. So it essentially averages the transformation across all the evidence that it's provided, and then it applies that transformation to the last thing that it's shown. So the idea is these attractor networks you've built would have different concepts stored within them of transformations, and then you can kind of call on any of those transformation concepts to complete the sequence as appropriate. Is that the idea? No, actually, it, it, so every time you run it, it knows nothing about any transformations. So every time you run it, it tries to learn what the transformation is that explains this particular data set. And so Spawn actually is kind of stupid because if a person was shown this, once they figure out what the pattern is, the next time you show them, they don't even think about it, right? They already know the pattern. So they can you know, use their experience to then process new patterns using what they've already learned. Spawn actually, every single time you show it a pattern, it's like, oh, wow, this is a new pattern. What could it be? And then it does this comparison sort of element-wise by element-wise, computes this uh, guess at what the transformation is that explains the data it's been shown, and then applies that. So is this uh, induction task being done completely within uh, a network model? Yeah, it's uh, also and if, yeah so then how, um, I'm curious uh, what, how the procedural steps of the task are embodied in a network model. How does the network move through states to solve the task? Sure, so with all the tasks, the basal ganglia is playing the role of determining what the next appropriate network state is given the current state of the network. And so even, you know, every single task essentially has like an A, and then a letter, uh, then a number is shown, which tells it which task. So as soon as the basal ganglia sees an A coming in, it now is going to interpret whatever the next letter is as defining which state it needs to go into in order to start processing data that's about to come in. So it sees a zero, or in this case, it sees a seven, I think. And then, uh, so it goes into the state now. It loads in, it basically loads into its frontal cortex. I am doing the task where I have to interpret data in such and such a way. Everything gets updated in the network. And then the basal ganglia sits there and says, oh, I'm supposed to be doing this task. And you know, right now, I've got a 1 in my working memory. So I'll put that in the first working memory. And then the next step, it gets a 2. It says, OK, I'm at this point in the task. So I'll take that 2 and put it in my other working memory. And now I'll compute the transformation and so on and so forth. So it's basically the basal ganglia that's doing the organization of the sequencing through the task for every task. And this is a transition matrix that um, was learned. Uh, I saw reinforcement learning mentioned in the paper or uh, something that you've wired in. Uh, so we actually do both, right? So in the in so the overall model is probably best to think of as we have defined, you know, what in sort of very general terms, yeah, what the appropriate transition is given uh, states of the network. The reinforcement learning task lets the model actually update that transition matrix on its own for us one small particular task. So one of the things we're really trying to do right now actually is push it so we can, you know, give it more control over determining what the best transition matrix is. If you want to put it in, that, in those terms. I see. Cool. Yeah. I was about to ask uh, that exact same question in terms of task switching. Since it was already asked, um, I have a follow-up for that. Is in what what is the, um, the parallel between that kind of setting up the task in the basal ganglia and and the like the equivalent in the human brain? Does, does it happen? Do you did you model it uh, in a similar way, or what kind of simplifications and or, or what kind of desired? Was it a compromise? That, that's what I'm trying to understand. Um, so, you know, it's a hypothesis that we're testing. Um, we think that it's very much like what happens in the human brain. So the basal ganglia model that we have has all of the main components of the basal ganglia in it. Uh, it uses the same kinds of cells. So they're all, in, or not all, but mostly inhibitory cells using the right kinds of neurotransmitters. Uh, so the anatomy, the physiology is mapped onto what the human brain does. 
And then, of course, you know, the exact representations that we're using are ones that are hypothetical. Um, and you know, my current best guess is that there's more of an interaction between cortex and basal ganglia in determining uh, what the appropriate sequence of actions is. Um, so in this model, I would consider it a simplification that we have the basal ganglia always doing the action selection. Um, and that essentially doesn't transfer uh, things that it gets really good at to cortical representations, which I think the evidence sort of strongly suggests. And this is another thing that we're working on for future versions. But you know, to the extent that the basal ganglia is known to be important for action selection, um, that we've mapped the physiology and the anatomy, um, that you know we know we only have connections in the model which are really in the in the actual human brain. Um, we've really tried to make it a very plausible hypothesis about what the basal ganglia is doing when doing this selection. Thanks. Cool. Other questions? Yeah, well, I have another uh, question that's uh, along the same lines, which is, would it be a desired feature or, or something that you're working on that Spawn basically identifies what kind of task it's supposed to perform on its own? Is it, you present an input and it says, oh, it's probably this task or, or the other task. Is that, is that, it would seem like something that it could be easily <laughs> implemented, but is, is it something that you're, you're actually in, interested in? Um, so we're going about the issue of letting it learn new tasks uh, in two different ways. Um, so like at the moment, it will sort of see the stimulus A0, and then it will say, oh, I think that's this task. So it kind of does that already. Um, mm -hmm. But in, as far as like a brand new task, we're trying two things. One is, I think, what you're suggesting, which is essentially constructing a really simple language where we could give it instructions, and it, it could understand the instructions and then perform a task based on those instructions. So essentially, you could say something in the instructions like, I'm going to give you some numbers, and I want you to repeat them backwards to me. And then it could figure out, OK, you know, after, after it parses the instructions, it sets itself up so then you know, it performs the appropriate um, action selection given the input. So that's basically like me telling you something in language, right? Um, the other thing we're trying to do is reinforcement learning, where we don't give it any explicit instruction, but instead we put it in a circumstance, you know, we um, give it rewards and punishments uh, when it does things that are good or bad, right, and let it figure out what are the appropriate steps so that I get the most reward. Um, so something like that is uh, also, that's actually the PhD thesis of one of my students right now. Um, the other stuff in language is actually, I think we should have something, a very simple version of that working for um, the end of January because we have to submit it to cognitive science. <laughs> so <clears throat> we are working on both of these things, or both of these approaches. And ultimately, I think they have to go together, right? So probably what happens is I express what I'd like someone to do to them, and then they get an idea, and then they get reward and punishment, you know, once they actually start performing the task. So ultimately, that's what I would try to do. Thank you. I think, I mean, it's awesome work, and it lives up to the hype. <laughs> Thanks. Basically, the first impression that people get when they read about the title that came out in Science is, oh, well, uh, this this could be a uh, like kind of a stunt. Uh, oh, oh, it's in science, so that's probably not the case. But then you go read the paper, and it's like <laughs> it lives up to the hype. So that's very kind. <laughs> Congratulations. Thank you. So I'll, I'll hold up for any for any additional questions here, but I just wanted to make these points. So I, just some of the things extract out like high level things. So I do think it makes impact as unification of a body of work of all these different models. Um, and I think that's really important, and we should see more of those sorts of unification things. I think, I, like I was saying, it, it occupies a particular space, a spot in a large space of brain modeling. And like I said, I think there are lots of valuable uh, models, and I think this is definitely one of them. I think it combines, so it combines models of behavior with models of spiking neurons, and it definitely delivers on that. And then, happily, it doesn't look like it's going to start uh, rising up and uh, a robot army and killing humans anytime soon. So that's good. Um, it seems like it's going to be peaceful uh, and uh, you know uh, diligently copying things down and, and, and that sort of thing. So so I'm happy about that. So if folks folks watching this are worried that uh, you know any of that's going to happen. Is uh, sometimes when I interact with the public, uh, folks think that it's don't sure. worry. We haven't he hasn't built the Terminator, so you know your children are safe. Um, don't don't we need to make sure there's some mirror neurons in there so it's empathetic or something to prevent that? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that might be that might be a good idea. Absolutely. Yeah, as a mob's rules, we need to control it. <laughs> yeah. 
So we've actually been discussing this kind of stuff uh, fairly seriously because honestly it comes up every single time I talk to people about the work. And you know, there are real questions here, right? So we laugh, of course, because it's a million miles away from Terminator and so on. But nevertheless, there are decisions to be made about what goals are the ones that you want it to try to achieve when it's doing, especially as we start in introducing more learning and so on into the model. Uh, so yeah, I have a tendency to sort of cringe when I hear that kind of concern, but I, on the, another part of me wants to at least think a little bit about that, right? I, I think a question that um, a lots of the general public would be interested in hearing about is what's next? Um, how, how quickly and how far do you hope to scale the simulation and the model? You, you said just now, you made an interesting comment, you're jealous of Henry Markham's big computer that he uses for the Blue Brain project. I mean, are you pursuing funding for a bigger computer? Um, so we're actually working with some groups who are building specialized computers. There's a group in the, in the UK, uh, the Spinnaker project. Um, oh, yes. There's another group in Stanford uh, building something called NeuroGrid. And so we're working with both of them closely because right now this model is ridiculously slow to run on even our supercomputers that we have around here. So, uh, you know, I would be ecstatic, but it's not impossible that within a year we would have a model of this scale running in real time on some of this hardware. Um, and once we do that, I mean, yeah, so the methods, it's not obvious to me yet where the methods will fail in scaling. Um, and I've made lots of arguments for why I think they will scale. Um, so in my new book, this is one of the major sort of themes is that I think this is a good approach because it really seems to be uh, good at scaling. But of course, uh, yeah, exactly how quickly is going to depend a lot on issues like what, if it, what is the available hardware? Um, and on also on things like our design skills and ability to incorporate things like uh, reinforcement learning and so on. Okay. But yeah. So you, me you, mentioned, you, you mentioned that the Spinnaker machine, that's that's the machine being built by Steve Ferber, I think, in Manchester. Yes, that's right. I, th I think that's going to come online. He expects it. Is it late in 2013? Right. So then you would start working with it late 2013 or 2014, what do you think? Um, yeah, we're actually working with them already. So we they have uh, one board which has 48 processors on it, and we've built models on that that actually have a simple basal ganglia model just like in Spawn and control a robot. So they like drive a robot around with a little fake hippocampus thing that has place cells and stuff in it. Uh, so yeah, we've been working very closely with them. Um, and so hopefully, and actually I think he's very interested in getting a model like Spawn on board of their machine because you know it's the kind of thing that can actually push the hardware. Um, so yeah, hopefully, you know, if everything works out, maybe by the end of 2013 we will have Spawn sitting on that computer. We'll see. Okay, great. I have a, I have one more uh, popular science question. Sure. And so um, Ray Kurzweil has been in the news a lot recently because he wrote this book, How to Create a Mind. I think that was yes, the right title. And then a month later, he's hired by Google and he's directing research with Google now. So then I hear that you're bringing out a book in early 2013, How to Build a Brain. Um, yep. A month after that, are we going to see you joining Google? <laughs> um, no, you won't see me joining Google. Uh, I've actually started a company, though, with somebody. <laughs> so the idea of commercialization is not um, infinitely far from our minds. Uh, the purpose of the company right now is R&D. Um, but yeah, there's a, there's a lot in a, an approach like this which is missing actually from a lot of artificial um, approaches to intelligence as well. So we're going to look at the possibilities of what kinds of commercialization uh, we can do. So that company is called Applied Brain Research. Okay. So if, if Google offered to buy that, um, well, it's a matter of how uh, much, isn't yeah. it? <laughs> I'll worry about that if it happens. <laughs> okay. As you mentioned, one of, I think, the major limitations of this is just that, and all AI models to date, is that you can train up little pieces of the model, little steps in the hierarchy, and that makes sense, right? Or you, you, you know, don't train the network explicitly, but you can come up with ways that your, your design algorithm would map onto a learning rule. Um, but it's very difficult to imagine training the entire brain up when all of those steps are put together unless you have some sense of what each of those steps needs to be doing and what the output should be at each stage. So I think your model is extremely interesting because you put all these steps together and it seems like it might be an ideal place to explore some of those learning algorithms that might operate on the entire hi hierarchy altogether. Are you pursuing that in any way? Absolutely, yeah. So um, 
Right, so the reinforcement learning stuff is essentially partly dependent on having some kind of error signal. Um, but we also, so I have another student whose focus is on learning, and he's actually done a simple reinforcement learning. He's the guy who did, Trevor Beckley, did the uh, reinforcement learning task that's in Spawn. Um, but in fact, the rule that he proposes has um, aspects of a self-organizing rule as well as a error-driven rule. And one thing that we're interested in looking at is how these two things interact, right? Because uh, one thing that it seems Visual Cortex, for instance, is doing, and presumably much of other Cortex, is matching the statistics of its input regardless of having explicit error signals being fed back. Uh, and so, yeah, we're interested in you know, thinking again about exactly how those two different ways of learning or different kinds of adaptation uh, will work with one another. Very cool. Thanks. Chris. Uh, uh, sorry, Ron. Oh, yes, I'll ask. So, Chris, do you think Spawn is pushing like the limits of what, what is already known in experimental literature? If you could sort of suggest one experiment for your ex experimental colleagues to sort of do to give Spawn a little more experimental grounding, what would you suggest? That's a really hard question. Um, you know, what? so I don't know about one experiment, but I think the concept that is uh, sort of critical to Spawn, which is not sufficiently appreciated in experimental literature, is the search for higher dimensional representations within sing single neurons. So this is actually a point that we made in a J Neuroscience paper in 2006, where we were talking about how if you want to model some working memory phenomena, if you assume that every neuron has two dimensions of sensitivity instead of one, which is what most people assume, you can build, build a, a really quite an elegant model, a very simple model, essentially, of what looks like fairly sophisticated dynamics. Uh, in Spawn, we've pushed this much farther, and we have you know 50 dimensional representations and 500 dimensional representations. Um, individual Can cells don't have by dimensions of representation. Yeah, individual cells don't have representations of those dimensions. I think the maximum is four. Uh, but even so, it would be I think very instructive and useful to start thinking about neurons as not trying to have a preferred stimulus that is sort of a one-dimensional stimulus, but rather think you know what's the space of sensitivity in which an entire population of neurons is uh, encoding information and processing information. And I think that will give a very different sense about why are there so many neurons that people throw out of their data set, right? What are, what are all these yeah. neurons that, you know, don't meet whatever criteria I'm picking? What are they doing there? Um, because often I think they're tuned, they're still playing a role in the computation, but they're just tuned to other dimensions you're not measuring. And so if you throw them out, your computation will actually be much lower quality than if you keep them in, even though they're not really responsive to the particular dimension you happen to be interested in. Right. Kind of so these would be like the, the non-responding neurons that are yeah. make up most or the of the ones brain. that just don't respond along the dimensions that we like, right? They, there's right. some weird mixture of the two things I'm testing or something. Mm -hmm. Those neurons are just as critical, and they're all over this model. Yeah, are they like complex cells? Can, can I think of them as complex cells? Uh, well, I wouldn't use that word just because it's got such yeah. a lot of uh, baggage from the visual system in particular, but um, just thinking about uh, neurons in a, in a as sort of being in a higher dimensional yeah. space than a single dimension, I think is a very useful thing to do. <laughs> okay, thanks. But I, uh, sorry, to conclude the answer, I struggle, and actually I'm working with some people, or we're, we're trying to think really hard, what are the experiments you need to do to distinguish between a one-dimensional neuron and a two-dimensional neuron and a three-dimensional neuron? And that's actually a very um, difficult problem, but one that I think it would be nice if more people were thinking about. I have a question. Um, that Basically, it's coming from the fact that I am working on the Open World project. Stephen is also working on the project as a coordinator. And basically trying to come up with a simulation of a cell-by-cell full-scale simulation of a C elegance. I wanted to know what do you think about uh, applying your approach to the C elegance, and I know that the C elegance doesn't have, doesn't have cognition and all that good stuff. But, uh, it's still capable of learning and uh, exhibits a wide range of behaviors and stuff. So, I mean, I, you might not be interested in that problem, but what would you think? And first of all, would you be interested in that in, in, in that challenge? And second, uh, how would you go about like, modeling uh, the range of C elegance behaviors uh, using your approach, or, and and so forth? Yeah, this is like uh, actually a really tough question. So, being me, of course, if I wanted to tackle this project, I would try to use the NEF to figure out what I thought the connection weights were between the neurons. And of course, it's highly constrained by known anatomy, which is, in a way, great. 
it would be a really good test of the NEF in some ways. But in another respect, uh, you know, I just, I'm sensitive to the fact that the neurons themselves are probably mm, playing a more central computational role in small circuits. Uh, they have lots of properties which don't seem to be um, sort of found in cortex in the same way. So, you know, cortex is like lots of neurons that are really, really similar. Um, but you, you find these highly specialized neurons when you start looking at uh, insects and worms and so on. And we haven't thought as much about how to use or exploit the dynamics of individual cells. This is something we're actually worrying more about now than we did in the original NEF book. Um, so, you know, I, I would basically go in naive and just try to apply the methods, try to understand sort of from a higher functional level what different elements of the system were trying to do, right? Trying to give some sense of what the function was and then use those methods to try to make that function go into the individual neurons. Um, but I also would not be surprised if it failed just because the NEF as currently stated isn't as sensitive to individual cellular dynamics as it really probably needs to be for those sorts of systems. And that's the trick because it's, it's still an open question as to what are all of the um, biological mechanisms that neurons use to process information. Um, for right. Sure. And I think it's, it's super convenient for us to, to use the features that, um, you know, the, the features that we have with, with spiking. And it obviously does actually match, um, you know, qualitatively to what we see under, under electrodes. But the challenge is, is that, um, you know, all, a lot of, in, in the deep neuroscience, there's all these exceptions to the rules for information processing where, you know, things like, uh, you know, spikes coming from, like, rebound inhibition, right, which wouldn't come from an integrated fire neuron. So there's all these things, and, and I guess the question, too, comes in, like, you know, is, is it really the case that we would expect that um, mammalian systems would have completely forgotten about how to take advantage of those other information processing mechanisms, or is it, is it that, you know, we have so many other things to worry about when we worry about mammalian systems that we just haven't looked as deeply into some of the cellular dynamics, also because it's ridiculously hard to actually constrain experimentally, because um, you're not going to, it's hard to, like, look at real-time, like, I don't know, gene transcription in a, in a neuron in a human or a, or a, or a mouse. So, um, anyway, this is, this is also, I just think, where, like, again, the bottom-up and the top-down, like, it's a really interesting place for discussion and for merging um, ideas about what are the information processing steps that matter. Right, Stephen, what we need is an NEF for designing single neurons. We need to be able to measure them electrophysiologically or just know what we, computations we want them to perform, and then we need to be able to, as you do for these networks, come up with some logical way of putting together ion channels or whatnot to yeah. have a neuron that produces X computation. And then you have your single neuron NEF with your <laughs> NEF for circuits, and, and we're done. No. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think we're building it, or it's being built, like by groups like the open open source brain and uh, like NIF, the neuroscience information framework. Like they're, I mean, yeah. So we're we're trying to like, you know, take all this all this information about neurons, and then someone will build a model of them, and someone will build like a computational, like or, like some functional model of the neuron. It's also we're coming together, but we're working on it. Exciting times. I think this is a really interesting field, and there's a lot of interesting interesting things happen, and. Not enough of these discussions, I think, make it out to the public. But right now, we have 13 people who have been sticking with us, I think, uh, throughout this whole thing who have been watching this. So to you guys who are watching live, like, awesome. If you're watching this, like, after the fact, and you've gotten this far, uh, you know, on YouTube or something, congrats to you as well. Um, I am going to have to wrap it up for time, uh, just because I think we all have other things we need to get, get done. But I really want to thank all of you uh, for participating in the channel here. I really want to thank Chris for jumping on. Uh, mm -hmm. that's, but that was awesome. That added a lot. So thank you. Thanks uh, for organizing it. This is great. And, uh, yeah, my pleasure. And, uh, you know, I think that, um, I think that the more of this stuff gets out there in the world, I think it's, it's only the better for all of us. So, um, I will bid you guys adieu and look forward to the next Dangerous Ideas Journal Club. Watch the Google Plus channel, uh, for other exciting things and propose things too. I can't be the only one presenting these things. Forever, I'm totally open for other people to get up onto the hot seat and um, present papers. And so if you have ideas for papers, not even in neuroscience, but just in other areas that are exciting, um, please let me know. And perhaps you, too, can have the author of Awesome Papers join you in channel and talk about them. 
uh, with uh, with talented folks. So drop me a line. I'm Stephen Larson um, at gmail.com. All right, everybody, take care. Bye, everyone. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks, Thanks Bob. Yeah, that was great. Thanks.